Let me pray, and uh, I'm excited for our message today. God, thank you for uh, just allowing us to gather together on this day, this Resurrection Sunday, um, and uh, thank you for everyone that's here. And God, uh, uh, I pray you help us to have open hearts, open minds, uh, help us to think clearly and critically, um, and just to be open to receive what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Speaking of the Easter bunny, um, here's a picture. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, Easter bunnies were small and cute. There is no picture. Uh-oh, we darn thing crashes all the time. We need to get a Mac. <laughs> Macs don't crash. I'm kidding. Um, but uh, let, me, let me go back a little bit. We are in actually the ninth week of a series that I called Coexist with a question mark. Um, and you see that bumper sticker all around, especially in Santa Cruz County. Um, but it is, um, we are working through the Apostles' Creed, really trying to understand what is basic Christianity. Um, and uh, I'll give you some of the, well, I, let me tell my, my goals while I, hopefully the computer kicks back on. Uh, the goal is really to understand what Christianity is and what it isn't. In fact, the word Christian can mean different things to different people. Uh, we have so many different names on church buildings. Uh, I remember as a kid, I grew up in a little tiny Lutheran church, and then one year they started construction just across the field, a Presbyterian church. And I was so confused. What's the difference? Why are there so many different names on churches? The Apostles' Creed is really what we all have in common. Um, and it has been around since the very beginning. But my goal is also to help us learn things about other religions, about other philosophies, about other beliefs, and how they might be similar to Christianity in some ways, um, but also how they are different. Um, they estimate between um, 5% of our DNA and 3% or 2% of our DNA is different than a monkey. That matters. That 5% matters. Uh, it really does. Um, and so the third thing is, is to learn how we can talk with people of other faiths. Uh, in today's very toxic tribal culture where people uh, who are different than us are often vilified. And I believe that as Christians, especially, we need to rise above that, uh, whether it's religion or politics, um, and we can disagree, but be respectful and loving, no matter who they are, and we can be good neighbors. And so, I want to read to you a passage. Did it, did it get going? No, it's still not going. Uh, let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, this is what a lot of scholars consider to be one of the earliest creeds in the church, like within a few years of the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, this was a saying, it was sometimes um, chanted or sung, uh, but it, uh, it was a very popular early creed of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm just going to read part of it to you, but Paul says, For what I have received, I pass on to you as of first importance. Okay, this is it. This is what is the most important, most critical thing as to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of his brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living. In other words, go talk to them. Though some have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for early Christians, which was physical death. They understood the death was not the end. There was a resurrection coming, and so they used this euphemism, falling asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And Paul will go on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and he will say, if Jesus was not risen from the dead, if he did not die and rise again from the dead, then our faith is futile. It means nothing. It's, it's make-believe. It might as well have faith in Santa Claus. Secondly, he says, there is no forgiveness for sins. 
If Christ did not rise from the dead, then we are dead in our sins, and either we need to work ourselves out of that sin, which is impossible. And then thirdly, he says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. In other words, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and our only hope is in this life, then we are, of all people, most to be pitied. If the resurrection is not true, if Jesus did not die and actually physically rise from the dead, if you call yourself a Christian, we are to be pitied if that is not true. Now, the resurrection has been, has been challenged throughout the centuries. It has been um, um, considered uh, make-believe. Uh, let me give you some, some examples of some historical figures. Karl Marx, uh, he termed Christianity the opiate of the masses, a tool for exploitation. Sigmund Freud called Christianity an illusion, uh, a crutch, a source of guilt and pathologies. Bertrand Russell said, I say quite deliberately that the Christian religion as, an or, as organized in its churches has been and still is the principal enemy of the moral progress in the world. And then the famous Gregory House MD said, rational arguments don't usually work on religious people, otherwise there would be no religious people. Now Christianity for many people today is seen as a crutch. Uh, it is seen as something that impedes science. It is seen as a source of bigotry, both racial and gender bigotry. Uh, many people view religion, especially Christianity, as something that causes wars, is the reason we have pollution, uh, animal extinction, and overpopulation and inflation is all blamed on Christians. Now, I don't know if you guys um, ever have listened to Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson, but a couple of years ago, they had this debate about faith and about religion uh, and it's on YouTube. You can get it. It was several hours, several sessions. Uh, and these are two very, very brilliant people. What I love and appreciate is they are willing to discuss and debate difficult issues. I want to show you a one-minute clip here as they discuss the resurrection. Take a look at this. If someone once asked you whether you thought Jesus was literally resurrected, and you said it would take me 40 hours to answer that question. Okay, that's... That's the, that's the kind of thing I'm responding to here. You don't need to do that if you have a clear-cut answer to that question. And I don't you, have a clear-cut answer and to that question. And if you don't, and if you don't, that that connects with many other things that we still have to talk about. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think because because that it and, isn't and, and, obvious in the biblical account that Christ was literally resurrected. So it's not well, simple. This no, is not no, no, simple. No, it, no, but if the question is, do you think he? Well, let's, let's put it probabilistically. I mean, anything's possible. I'll tell you that it's possible that he was physically resurrected. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's even possible Wait a second. I didn't with respect say to quantum mechanics. Was. The point is... I said it, it would take me 40 hours to answer the question. I didn't say that he was. Well, go ahead. Well, how's this for an answer? Almost certainly not. Yeah. Well, someone wants... Did you pick up the, the conversation there? It, you can see Sam Harris, he is adamant that the physical resurrection, and here's what I appreciate about him, he understands the significance of the physical resurrection of Jesus. He doesn't buy into it, he doesn't believe it, he doesn't accept it. Jordan Peterson, on the other hand, is wrestling with it. He's not sure if it's physical, and he said something which kind of betrays his ignorance to the scriptures, is that it's not obvious that he physically rose from the dead in the scriptures. Well, we're going to look at that today, and we're going to discuss that today. But I want to start off with this statement. The question we must ask, whether you're a Christian or whether you're an atheist or agnostic or a seeker, wherever you're at, by the way, you're welcome here at Boulder Creek. This is a safe place to ask questions, to be critical, to think. We don't ask you to check your minds at the door when you walk in. We want you to think. But here's a question, a statement that I want to make. The question that we must ask is not, does Christianity work? Or do I like it? The question we must ask is, is it true? 
Is it true? The central reality of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if the resurrection is true, everything else becomes plausible. Islam believes that Jesus was a great prophet, but he did not die on the cross. He was substituted, uh, and it was actually Judas that hung on the cross. Um, and so he was not resurrected. Jesus was actually, uh, as I said, substituted. Judaism does not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They do not believe Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, a teacher that led a rebellion in the first century, and then stories rose up, and Rumors spread, and it ended up becoming something much bigger than what it actually was. Eastern religions, which include Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, they don't address this issue, but more modern religious leaders believe Jesus was reincarnated into another life. Many of the New Age beliefs, which are very popular uh, in Santa Cruz County, um, for example, one including the Baha'i faith believed that it was a spiritual resurrection. It was not a physical. It was a spiritual resurrection, which is more of a metaphor for new beginnings for you and I. And then you have Mormons who believe Jesus was not hung on the cross, but impaled on a pole. Uh, and Jehovah Witnesses believe that he was only spiritually resurrected as well. And so the resurrection while it's controversial today, was extremely controversial in the first century. But in the last 150 years or so, many people have come up with many different explanations as to why Jesus did not rise from the dead. Let me give you five common explanations for the resurrection of Jesus. And the first one is the wrong tomb. They went to the wrong tomb. Somewhere Jesus was buried, nobody knew about it, but, but think about that just for a sec. We have eyewitness accounts, we have a name, Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb he owned, and he went to the Roman leaders, went to Pilate, got permission, he was high up in the religious uh, Jewish system, and they buried Jesus. They knew exactly where the tomb was. In fact, the religious leaders had Romans post guards they didn't post guards at the wrong tomb. They're not that dumb. <laughs> and so all the opponents would have had to do if, in fact, the disciples stumbled their way early Sunday morning to the wrong tomb and found it empty, all they had to do was produce a body. And Christianity would have ended there. Another famous uh, assumption or belief is what's called the hallucination theory. Uh, the disciples so badly wanted to believe that Jesus would rise from the dead that they convinced themselves that it really happened. Now, a couple things about hallucin uh, hallucinations. They generally occur to people who are very imaginative and of a nervous makeup. And no two people have the same hallucination. Some of the followers of Jesus didn't badly want Jesus to rise from the dead. They didn't believe it. They were skeptics. James, the brother of Jesus. Thomas was the doubter. And so they were hostile or even doubtful about the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus appeared on several occasions in different places and at different times after he rose from the dead. In fact, we read it in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared at one time to over 500 people. Okay, 500 people don't have the same hallucination at the same time. And so Paul, in essence, says, many of them are still alive. Go ask them. Eyewitness accounts. Another popular theory is the swoon theory. Swoon theory. Uh, <laughs> Crucifixion, and this, this is really silly because uh, it, it, it comes from what, what they call cultural elitism. Oh, those simple-minded people 2,000 years ago, they didn't really know. They, they were superstitious. They believed in all kinds of wacky things, and that is really uh, unfair to first century people, but it also completely disregards how serious Romans were about death and how serious Hebrews and Jews were about the truth. Crucifixion was designed to cause the greatest amount of pain and certain death. 
Roman soldiers were experts at this. They knew the, diff they knew the difference between death and fainting. Um, and they took several precautions to ensure death. It's why they broke the legs of the thieves that were on either side of Jesus. It's why they took the spear and plunged it into the side of Jesus. And the scriptures tell us that water and blood poured out. Let me talk about that experience for just a sec. Let me talk about what happened before Jesus even hung on the cross. Uh, there was such a thing called Roman flogging. In fact, I think I have a picture of a replica of a flagrum. This was um, made up of leather strips. It often had metal balls or even shards of bone on the tips of it. And they would slash it on the back of whoever they were punishing, and then it would stick into the back, and then they'd rip it down. Uh, and it would expose their back completely. It cut so, so severely into the skeletal muscles, the veins, the sinews, and the bowels of the victim. And here's what would be begin to happen physically to someone who was flogged and then hung on a cross. It would start with hypovolemic shock, which comes from an extreme loss of blood. The heart would race and pump because it's trying to get oxygen to the body, but blood isn't an, sufficient blood isn't coming through the heart. Uh, and so fainting begins to happen due to low blood, pr blood pressure. If you might remember, Jesus fell carrying the cross and he needed help. He was getting weaker. Kidneys begin to shut down in order to preserve body fluids, and then a person will become extremely thirsty. And you might remember that Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. And eventually the heart would begin to stop. But, but when the heart stops, and this is the key, when the heart stops, as a result, fluid gathers around the sac of the heart. Here's a picture of it. It's called pericardial effusion. And you can see the difference between a normal heart and one that has pericardial effusion, water, fluid surrounding in that sac around the heart. And then it would also happen to the lungs, which is called pleural effusion. And this is why when the spear was struck into Jesus' side, it certainly went through uh, one of these sacs, if not both. And so what looked like water, because our 75% of our bodies are made of water and blood, sprayed out. This was confirmation that the body was dead. Think of the logic of this theory, the swoon theory. They just thought he was dead, so they wrapped him in cloths, they put him in a tomb, and in the coolness of the tomb, he revived. And then when he revived, he suddenly found this strength to move that huge stone, which took several men to cover the, the face of that tomb, and then he broke out of that tomb and, wah, and fought the Roman guards, <laughs> defeated them, and then appeared to his disciples and said, I've risen from the dead. That seems ludicrous. And it seems like you need a lot more faith to believe that happened than to believe God rose him from the dead. The very first theory that existed was this next one called the stolen body theory. In fact, when the religious leaders found out that the tomb was empty, they convinced the guards who were scared out of their boots at this point, because they, they fell asleep at their post. Um, and that's not something a Roman guard does. So the religious leaders said, tell Pilate that the body was stolen and we'll cover for you. So this is the very first theory that existed. Now, two groups of people had motivation for this theory to be true. One, like I said, the religious people. The other one, his followers. His followers had motive to steal the body. But they didn't even believe at the time that Jesus was going to rise dead. He'd been telling them over and over and over, and they still didn't get it. They were afraid. They were hiding. It's not exactly Braveheart here. 
where they broke him out of the tomb and then claimed that he was risen from the dead. And again, all his enemies, all the enemies of, of, of Christianity had to do was produce the stolen body. Christianity would have ended there. Final one, the conspiracy theory. And this is the theory that the disciples made it up. Now, I've got at least five reasons why this theory is silly um, and, and, in my opinion, to be dismissed. Again, I've already addressed this. The disciples didn't believe. They were hiding. They were scared. They were confused. When you come across the Gospels, when you read the Gospels who were written by the disciples, they come across as complete bumbling idiots, always arguing about who's going to be the greatest, now, if you wanted people to believe your story, would you make yourself the antagonist? Thirdly, or secondly, they all fled in fear from the scene. One denied him, one betrayed him. And then thirdly, and this is for many people, modern people today, maybe the most convincing proof of the resurrection, and that is women were the first to eyewitness it. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us because we live in the modern world, we believe in equal rights and, and all that, but in the first century, we had truly a patriarchal system. Women were not trusted, women were not respected, and if you were going to, by the way, all four Gospels record women being the first to uh, experience the risen Jesus. If you wanted to convince people of a story that you were making up, if you had a conspiracy, you would not use women as eyewitnesses. They weren't even allowed to testify in court. In Luke chapter 24, verse 11, even the disciples, even the disciples who knew these women well, knew their character, did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Celsus, who was a Greek and pagan philosopher, uh, about 80 years after Jesus died, he hated Christianity, and he wrote books to refute Christianity. In one of his books called The True Word, he wrote this, one of the reasons we know Christianity cannot be true is because the accounts of the resurrection are based on the testimony of women, and we all know that women are hysterical. Better not hear any amens. <laughs> the only possible reason that all four gospel authors would include this in their biographies of Jesus is because it's what they saw. It's what they knew. Because it was true. Because the truth was more important to them than trying to push some story or sell some propaganda. And then, fourthly, who dies for what they know is a lie? Would you give your life for what you knew was a lie? It's one thing to die for the truth. It's one thing to die for a loved one. But all of the disciples suffered greatly and died for what they believed to be true, and that is that Jesus rose from the dead. And finally, how do you explain that change in the disciples? going from being fearful, hiding behind locked doors, to being boldly in public, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the risen Jesus, and suffering and dying for it. How do you account for that change in their lives? See, no culture back then would read this scene and consider Jesus honorable, worthy to be followed, and given your loyalty. This is not a hero's death. He's scared and stressed out and full of anxiety in the garden, asking for a way out. It is not a hero's death. See, we respect heroes. Here's some make believe heroes Iron Man. What did Iron Man do? Right? He got the glove. He snapped his finger. He gave his life. He sacrificed his life for the sake of the universe. Or how about this guy, Vision, willing to give his life. I know these made-up stories, but this is why they're heroes. 
In our perspective, heroes are victors who sacrifice, but they die honorably. Braveheart, for example. Or how about this guy, Groot? <laughs> now, I don't know if you've heard of the Babylon Bee. Babylon Bee is um, a, a satire. Uh, they make fun of people. They make fun of themselves. They happen to be conservative Christians. Uh, they make fun of politics, um, and they have great headlines. Uh, if you like satire, if you like sarcasm, uh, Babylon B is wonderful. Now, I want to be real clear here. I'm not promoting this. I, this I'm going to talk about a person here for a sec. I don't want anybody to freak out. I'm not promoting anything. Um, I'm simply observing something. I'm not making any judgment. But maybe you have heard of the God Bless the USA Bible. God Bless the USA Bible. Um, 60 bucks. You can get one of these. It includes the, some uh, American documents, the, what, what's it called? The Constitution. Uh, brain fart. Um, but here's my point in bringing this up. The Babylon Bee had a list of 10 things that are different in this Bible than in the regular Bible. And some of them are funny. Some of them are, eh. Number 10 struck me. This is what number 10 is. Jesus doesn't die in this one. Jesus doesn't die in this one. Now, now think about that statement. That statement affirms what I'm saying about Jesus. He did not die a hero's death. A hero wouldn't have died. He would have had victory over them or his death would have been more dignified. See, the only logical and reasonable explanation is this really happened. Now, today, the most significant message of coexist is basically all roads lead to the same God. If it works for you, if it makes you happy, it doesn't really matter. We cannot come into Christianity because it works or because it feels good or improves our lives or makes us feel better about ourselves or makes us successful. We must come into Christianity because it is true, because it's historical. And then we will find that it works for us. The early church had one unifying message. They suffered for it and many died for it. Jesus was risen from the dead. Now, as I close, so what? What difference does it make? What does the resurrection mean for us today? Let me give you seven. I could have come up with 30, and I'm just going to go through these quickly. Because the resurrection happened, because it is true, it means you're loved. And you might not accept this, but I know this to be true about you. There's nothing you want more than to be loved. And there's nothing that you want more than to be known. And that's why some of you hide. Because to be known, truly known, might mean I'm not loved. But think about it. God fully knows you all of your quirks, all of your shortcomings, all of your sin. And at the very same time, he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave. And he loves Muslims, and he loves Hindus, and he loves Buddhists, and he loves atheists, and he loves Sam Harris, and he loves Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Secondly, it means that we have forgiveness. Because the resurrection is real, we have forgiveness. And this is important because Jesus did not come to be an example. We could never live up to that example. It's like me trying to shoot like Steph Curry. He's my role model. I'm a failure. I'll never be that good. He came to be a savior. Because that's what we needed. We needed a savior. And I want to remind you, I've said this many times, 
We've been here. It's not the good are in and the bad are out. It's the humble are in and the proud are out. The only thing that will keep you from heaven and eternity with Christ is your own pride. Thirdly, the resurrection gives us hope. It gives us hope. Peter said, he, that is Jesus, has given us a new birth into a living hope. It's not a dead hope, it's a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have the hope of a future resurrection for us. Now pause right there before I go through the other four. We are presently loved. We are forgiven for our past. We have hope for our future. Our entire life finds meaning in the resurrection of Jesus. Fourthly, we have strength and courage because we can remember that we're never alone. I don't need to be afraid of dying no matter what I face in life. Financial struggles, health issues, whatever it is, we have the promise that he will be with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so we can have courage. We can live boldly because we have the approval of the master of the universe, the one that matters most. And then next, we have a new identity. He makes everything new. Your past does not define you. Your failures do not name you. When you come into Christ, you are given a new identity. You are made new in him. And because of the resurrection, we have comfort in our loss and in our pain. And finally, we have purpose. We have meaning for our lives. We have something greater than ourselves, something outside, outside of ourselves to live for. Now, decision time. We're only given a few opportunities in life that could be considered defining moments in our life. Today could be a defining moment for some of you. Have you ever given your life to Jesus? I'm not saying, do you believe? I mean, do you really, have you trusted? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you asked him to forgive you for your sins? Maybe, maybe you did that once, but your life has gotten off course. You've, you've drifted, you've slipped away, and it happens to all of us. It happens many times. Decide today. Decide today what you're going to live for, who you're going to live for. Jesus said himself, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And maybe for some of you, the decision is to investigate, to ask questions, to meet with somebody, uh, to, to, to bring all of your concerns and questions that you have about the scriptures, about, about Christianity, about this life, about God, and, and be honest with those. In fact, I would challenge some of you in this room today to pray a simple prayer and then wait and see what God does. Pray the simple pray, prayer. God, if you're real, show me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what the cross means for us who believe. It means we're loved. It means we have hope. It means we have forgiveness. All these things, God, that we just discussed. And I pray, God, that those things would become increasingly uh, stronger in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. So much so that we would experience the life change that the early disciples did, who were hiding and then preaching in the public square boldly and suffering for it. Um, change our lives, God. And God, as we take communion together this morning, we're just mindful that as we do this in remembrance of you, and so let our hearts just pause. Let our minds slow down and just think for a moment of the implications of what we're doing. And God, for anyone in this room who's never 
given their life to you, maybe they would say a simple prayer. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, I don't know what the implications are, but come into my heart, come into my life, and make me a new and different person. In Jesus' name, amen.